Welcome everyone, selamat datang. As we commence, I want to acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians and the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people from whose traditional lands the ANU campus rests and pay our respects to the elders past and present. I'm Evanisa. It is my great pleasure to welcome you all this evening to the inaugural Tony and Johanny Jones lecture hosted by the ANU Indonesia Institute. Welcome Pak Tony, Tashawafna Bifongurikum, Ibu Yohani, uh, welcome uh, David, Michael, Monica, Kate. Um, this annual lecture series honors both Tony and Johannes' enduring legacy at AU, focusing on humanities studies across Nusantara and the Malay and Islamic worlds, as well as the examination of the Austronesian identity. It is also hoped that this lecture series will help advance the course of Southeast Asian understanding in Australia, as well as celebrating two giants of the field who have contributed so much to contemporary knowledge of the region. This lecture series was made possible by the generosity of Emeritus Professor Anthony Reed. Welcome, Pat Tony as well as friends and family of Pak Tony and Johanna Jones. It is now my pleasure to welcome our opening speaker for this evening, the Indonesian ambassador, His Excellency Dr. Siswo Pramono. Please join me in welcoming His Excellency Dr. Siswo Pramono. Thank you very much. And thank you for this invitation. I think uh, I'm very lucky uh, today, to be able to be here with you on the inaugural of uh, Tony and Johanny George lecture. Uh, I was also a student in here, a book, but I finished in 2003. <laughs> I got information from his work that, okay, uh, the, uh, Tony retired in uh, 1993. So uh, we have a, a decade difference. <laughs> but I heard about uh, uh, very great uh, persons, but Pak Tony, uh, uh, Ibu Yohani, on, the, on your roles in uh, promoting uh, this uh, Indonesia and Islamic studies in here as well. So uh, we're really a great honor to meet you in person uh, today. And thank you, Pak Tony, also to invite us. And uh, the lecture today by Pak Rex is also very interesting on the restoring religious and cultural complexity to the study of Southeast Asian, Asian Islam. I myself now more as a practitioner in diplomacy and international relations. Yeah. And the role of this uh, cultures and understanding of religions is pretty much uh, related and uh, actually is very essential on the success of a policy. Uh, it's just a story about uh, the real thing that I'm doing from in my daily life, for instance, we in Australia discuss on the halal industry, and I have the opportunity to, to, to visit uh, with uh, Pak Najib. And GPS is the largest operator in the southern hemisphere. It's very modern, but it's also produced the halal meat. And the way they do the slaughters, 3,400 head per day, uh, according to the Islamic rules and, and the Sharia. No, but still, there is a lot of debate whether technically this uh, Islamic enough uh, because the uh, the difference in the not only an understanding of the Islamic culture and so on, and also the various uh, what's called congregation or uh, 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 various uh, schools in, in Islamic teaching as well. So understanding uh, these things that you are going to. Uh, present uh, to us today, and we are going to learn more about that. About that is very important in the practical aspect of diplomacy as well, as far as my profession is concerned. So, again, thank you very much. I think we are going to learn a lot, and let's celebrate against this uh, uh, inaugural Tony and Johan, Johan, Johan Jones lectures. And we will come also your lecture that's very, very fun for uh, our time today. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, His Excellency Dr. Sisbor Kalamo. I am now pleased to welcome Professor Helen Sullivan, Dean of the Australian National University College of Asia and the Pacific. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Professor Helen Sullivan. Uh, well, I'm very conscious that I'm the only person standing between you and a fascinating lecture, so I shall uh, be brief, but it is an absolute privilege uh, to be here this evening to um, acknowledge the extraordinary contribution of Tony and Yohani Johns um, to uh, the studies of um, Indonesia, Southeast Asia, Islam, all of the things that as the Australian National University, and in particular, as the College of Asia and the Pacific, we hold incredibly dear. Um, so it is an extraordinary honor for me to be able to um, stand here with you this evening and uh, say a few words of welcome. Um, before, as we begin though, I would like to acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands and indeed airwaves we meet today and pay my respect to elders past and present. The, ANU, as none of you uh, will need reminding, um, is uh, the place where um, the study of our region, Asia, the Pacific, Australia's place in Asia and the Pacific, is at the core of the foundation of the university. And it is something that in the 76 years that the university has existed, uh, has been something that we hold dear and the work of people like Tony and Yohani uh, has really demonstrated the importance of that kind of contribution to our understanding both of who we are but also our place in the world. Now we have an ongoing and continuing commitment to the study of Indonesia and indeed of Southeast Asia. But you won't need me to tell you that being in higher education at the moment is not an easy place to be, even the ANU. Uh, the level of expectation of the ANU, quite rightly, because we are the national university, is that we do the things that other universities don't do. And that is an incredible responsibility. And um, is one that we take very, very seriously. We continue to support the next generation. And I just want to mention, um, in addition to the, the wonderful work of, of Dr. Eva Nisa, um, that uh, we continue to support the development of the next generation. Just this year, we appointed two outstanding Indonesia scholars, Eve Warburton and Sana Jaffrey, to uh, the college. Uh, these are colleagues who will really be at the forefront um, of their area of expertise for many, many years to come. In addition, uh, we support, of course, the development of extremely important, but not terribly financially viable research. Um, so for example, uh, the DECRA, uh, which is a very prestigious award, as many of you will know from the Australian Research Council, uh, recently won uh, by Dr. Ying Xing So, who, um, whose project is Unmaking Homeland Sinophone Literature and Cold War Culture in Malaya, uh, which is in the humanities. So uh, the work that we do, the range of people that we are still developing and supporting, um, following in the footsteps of extraordinary people like Tony and Yohani Jones, is very, very important to us. Uh, but it is something that is not easy to do in the current environment. And that brings me to the last thing that I would want to say, which is to express my extraordinary gratitude to Tony and Helen Mead for their outstanding generosity in establishing the fund uh, to support this lecture series uh, and to make possible um, some things that we know are really, really important, uh, but it can be very, very hard to do. So. I am in your debt, Tony, and um, I am incredibly conscious of your generosity. And uh, I would like to, to say thank you very, very much for everything that you have done and everything that you, I know, are going to continue to do. And with that, um, I will 
at stop and uh, as I say, not get in the way any longer of, of why you're all here, which is to listen to Greg. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Helen Sullivan. It is now my great pleasure to welcome our guest lecturer for the inaugural Tony and Johanna Jones lecture, Emeritus Professor Greg Feely. But Greg Feely is Emeritus Professor in the Department of Political and Social Change. He specializes in the study of Islamic politics and history, primarily in Indonesia, but also in other Muslim majority regions in Southeast Asia. Emeritus Professor Feely will be presenting this evening on restoring religious and cultural complexity to the study of Southeast Asian Islam. Please join me in welcoming Emeritus Professor Feely. Thank you, Eva, for your kind introduction, and also to His Excellency Papa Sisvo Pramono, and also Helen Sullivan for their uh, opening remarks. It's a privilege to be invited to give this inaugural address in honour of Tony and Johanny Johns. In the long and distinguished history of Southeast Asian studies at ANU, no other couple have made such a sustained and substantial contribution. For more than three decades, Tony and Johanny were the bedrock upon which studies of the region, and especially Indonesia, rested. For much of the next 35 minutes, I will be talking mainly about Tony's remarkable academic achievements because I have worked most closely with him. But this is an endowment that honours the work of both Johanny and Tony, and they have indeed been an extraordinary and mutually supportive partnership. Both shared in and contributed to the successes of the other. They provided frank counsel to each other and were always respectful of differences of opinion. In my mind, and I suspect in the minds of many others who have come to know them, whenever one hears Tony's name or Johanny's name, Johanny's name Almost immediately, one's mind adds the name of the other because they were always seen as a pair, this indissoluble link between them. Uh, and no account of the rise of Asian studies at ANU is complete without their story. Having said that, I will be spending less time discussing your honey than Tony, and for that, I apologise, your honey. I hope this imbalance will be redressed in a later Annual John's lecture. So my talk is divided into three sections. First, I want to trace over the careers of both Tony and Johanny. Second, I will examine in more detail Tony's scholarship. And third, I want to turn to the thematic part of my talk in which I will address the topic of restoring religious and cultural complexity to the study of Southeast Asian Islam. So let me begin with Tony and Johanny's careers. Tony was born in England in 1928 and Johanny a year later in the province of West Sumatra, Indonesia. In Tony's childhood, he'd come to know something of Islam by reading books in his grandfather's library, books such as the Arabian Nights. He was conscripted into the British Army in 1946 and somewhat fortuitously for Tony, was sent to Singapore and Malaya the following year. There he became bewitched with the Malay world and language, as well as with the Muslim life that he observed around him. Many years later, he would recall the following. A seed of understanding was sown when Malay friends in 1949 invited me to be present at the congregational prayer of the Idul Adha in the Abu Bakar Mosque in Johor Bahru. For half an hour before formal prayers began, I listened to the takbir, the congregational chanting of the phrase and prayer Allahu Akbar. There was rhythm, movement, exultation in their voices that rolled like the swell of the sea. It stayed in my mind and haunted my memory. It was an introduction to the resonances of Arabic as a liturgical language. After concluding military service, Tony returned to England and studied classical Malay language, culture and literature at the School of Oriental and Asian Studies in London, eventually graduating with a PhD. 
but he yearned to return to Southeast Asia and he got his chance in 1954 when the Ford Foundation employed him as an English language teacher in Indonesia. He was very quickly swept up in the vibrancy of the country. After the staidness of Malaysia, he found Indonesia, to use his own words, a mind-blowing experience. He was fascinated with the swirl of revolutionary fervour within the newly independent nation. He listened to the soaring rhetoric of Sukarno, beheld the clamorous campaigning of the diverse array of politicians and parties contesting elections in the mid-1950s. He devoured the works of contemporary authors as they wrote on their hopes and despair about their new nation. A gifted musician himself, he also took in the diverse palette of music and the arts that surrounded him, including learning to sing Javanese music. After years of studying classical Malay texts from centuries past, he now found himself immersed in something that was immediate and brimming with passion. He later wrote he had found, and I quote, something to relate to from the heart. Most of all, he found that Indonesia presented a, great, a gateway to the world of Islam with a far greater range of Muslim expression than he had encountered in Malaya. It was also here in Indonesia where Tony met and fell in love with Johanny, a young in-service trainer in the Ford Foundation project in early 1955. As their romance blossomed, a large obstacle presented itself. Johanny was from a strict Muslim family and Tony was a devout Catholic. Interfaith marriages were, and indeed still are, frowned upon in many parts of Indonesia and are often implacably rejected by the families concerned. But Tony and Johanny were not deterred. And in an early display of their combined resolve and resourcefulness, they were eventually married in Singapore in 1956, I think, I have the right year for that. They recently celebrated their 66th wedding anniversary, and they remain a splendid example of how marriages across faiths can flourish with the religiosity of each partner respected and embraced and the undership underpinned by mutual love. In 1958, Tony was appointed to what was then known the Canberra University College, soon to become ANU. And he was employed to teach Malay and Indonesian studies. This was actually part of what was known as the reverse Colombo plan, in which the Indonesian government funded the teaching of Bahasa Indonesia for Australian students. So Tony's original salary was coming from Jakarta, not from Canberra. <laughs> Tony soon put together a team that would make our ANU one of the leading centres for studying Indonesia. He recruited Subati and later Supomo from Indonesia, who would become very dear colleagues, and he employed many other Indonesians in the program. Johanny herself, a skilled linguist and experienced teacher, became a tutor in 1961 and a few years later was appointed lecturer. Over the next three decades, she became a central figure in the Indonesian Studies program. She wrote two very popular textbooks, Bahasa Indonesia, Introduction to Indonesian Language and Culture, Volumes 1 and 2, which became pretty much standard texts across Australia for secondary and tertiary students, including me, I must say. The books are reprinted a great many times and were also used overseas, including in the Netherlands and the United States. In the following years, Johanny's teaching left an indelible impression on many hundreds of students who passed through ANU's Indonesian program, not to mention the thousands of people across numerous countries who learned Indonesian through her textbooks. Tony was promoted to professor in 1963 and served several terms as Dean of the then Faculty of Oriental Studies, later to become the Faculty of Asian Studies. The mid-1960s, apologies, 1960s were a watershed year for Tony, as he shifted the focus of his research more intently to Arabic and Islamic disciplines. He took study leave in Egypt and various other parts of the Middle East, which he initially found deeply challenging, 
He complained that his Arabic was inadequate and it took intensive study for him to begin to use the kind of texts that he regarded as essential for the next stage of his academic life. His concentration on Arabic met with disapproval from some of his Southeast Asian colleagues who feared that he would move away from the study of the region. But in fact, Tony's reason for becoming an Arabist was to better understand Indonesian Islam, Southeast Asian Islam. He felt that deeper knowledge of Indonesian scholarship could only be gained by having first-hand access to the great texts and disciplines that Indonesian Islamic scholars themselves used. And this could only be done with a high level of Arabic competency. In the late 1960s, he began teaching Arabic at ANU, and he had a vision that Arabic would be located within Southeast Asian studies, a unique initiative that would, in later years, produce a string of excellent scholars. To mention just a few, Tony Street, who's now a reader in Cambridge, the late father, Laurie Fitzgerald, who taught both at ANU and I think the Australian Catholic University. Uh, the recently retired um, Peter Riddell, who was a professor in the Melbourne School of Theology, and Mike Latham, who many of you will know, who is a professor of history at Princeton University. Sadly, this novel integration of Southeast Asian, Arabic and Islamic studies came to an end a little over 20 years ago, and no similar program exists to my knowledge now outside of Southeast Asia. Tony retired, as Pat Siswo has already mentioned, in 1993, after 35 years of service at A2ANU. Johanny retired as a senior lecturer two years later. Let me now turn to Tony's scholarship and his teaching. Tony's scholarly output has been immense, and I'm pleased to note that it's still growing. By my reckoning, Tony has published 78 articles in scholarly journals, 47 book chapters, 19 reviews, and 10 books. One could also mention all the entries he's made to major reference works, such as his seven articles in Brill's monumental Encyclopedia of Islam, a signal honor indeed to be asked to contribute um, so much to such a respected work. The broad arc of Tony's work is as follows. He began in Southeast Asia studying Sufi Malay language texts, then graduated to the study of the teachers of the Islamic scholars in the Middle East and the Arabic language foundational texts that they used, that is the Southeast Asian scholars used. And then he ended, or the final stage of his career was devoted largely to the study of the Quran. Within this arc, the scope of his work was extraordinary. It includes translations and commentaries on classical Malay Islamic texts, translations of modern Indonesian literature, descriptions and analysis of Islamic mysticism, Quranic exegesis, of course, Islamic theology and comparative theology, Australia's Muslim community, interfaith relations, historical accounts of Islam's coming to an influence upon Southeast Asia, and later studies of the prophets that one finds in not only Islamic scripture, but also Christian and Judaic scripture as well. And indeed, it is this latter work on the prophets of which Tony is most proud. Across these topics, Tony was capable of writing in a highly specialized, or narrow or niche way, sometimes dealing with obscure texts or issues, producing findings that might only have been read by, sorry to be honest, a handful of people around the world who possessed similar skills. But he was also equally capable of addressing big questions in the field and engaging in rigorous debate with other eminent scholars. Uh, the cream of his, scholarly, of his work, I think, can be found in scholarly journal articles rather than in his books. And just to read down the list of these articles, or of these journals, I won't go through them, but they are the leading journals in their field. The Journal of Islamic Studies, Journal of Southeast Asian History, Journal of Asian Studies, um, Journal of the Royal Asiatic Society of Great Britain, uh, Hamdard Islamicus, and including works such as Mianjin Quarterly and Quadrants. So Tony was also, to some extent, a public academic. One of the first articles I read of Tony's was his, cha was his challenging of the view that it had been traders who were primarily responsible for the spread of Islam to Southeast Asia. 
Tony didn't dispute that merchants had played a role, but he argued the deeper penetration of Islam was due to learned men, mystics, Islamic scholars, scriveners and the like, rather than the mercantile classes. He promoted the idea that of people and communities interacting to produce new ways of living and establishing new foundations of faith. This is often referred to as the Dravers Johns debate um, among scholars, with a reference to the Dutch uh, Indonesian scholar um, DWJ Dravers. Uh, Tony later, later substantially revised his opinion on this, but nonetheless, it was a substantial contribution to academic debate. Uh, given the time constraints, I need to not so much discuss some of the content of Tony's um, research, but to consider its essence. Tony recently wrote that his concerns throughout his career were, and always have been, language, character, and human responses to crises, of pain, joy, and hope. It is at once technical to have command of the necessary languages to undertake this work, but also quintessentially human. Tony was ultimately concerned with people. Linguistic, literary and historical skills were all a means of gaining insight into the lives and motivations of individuals and their communities. And for him, Arabic was a subtext behind vernacular writings showing how faith was understood. Tony was always talking about and continues to talk about layers. The task of the scholar was to explore what these layers contained. The outward superficial layer was perhaps at best a small part of the story. One had to have linguistic and disciplinary skills plus the imagination to delve further. This subtle, sensitive exploration of sources and human feelings was present in all of Tony's teachings and his writings. He brought a similar sensibility to his teaching. In classes, he was always urging students to feel the rhythm of the Quran, of the Quranic verses, or feel the sounds of Indonesian or Arabic words. He urged memorization of Quranic verses because that way students could experience the words unfettered by printed page. There was nothing detached or mechanical. One had to embrace the language and its culture wholeheartedly. One had to be precise, exacting, and show full respect for the original text fully understanding the words and how their meaning might change within sentences and different contexts. In an introduction to a forthcoming volume, Tony has written that his scholarly journal, journey, uh, journey has been one of as much, sorry, his scholarly journey has been as much one of unlearning as learning. This typifies his humility and constant introspection. In his later work, he is frequently at pains to reflect back upon his earlier writings, diligently noting where he may have been in error, uh, whether in fact or in interpretation. This sense of fallibility and striving for improvement is a hallmark of his scholarship, accuracy, not ego or defensiveness. I now want to turn to the theme that I've taken for this address, restoring religious um, uh, and cultural complexity to the study of Southeast Asian Islam. So over the past 20 or 30 years, we've seen a change in the scholarly and policy, policy discourse on Islam, including Islam in Southeast Asia. Whereas once this field gave prominence to scholars of religion and its culture and history, now social scientists, particularly political scientists and experts in international relations and security studies have come to dominate. This is especially the case since the terrorist attacks on New York and Washington DC in September 2001, the 9-11 attacks. With this catastrophic event, Islam suddenly leapt to being a paramount, if not the paramount issue for governments around the world, especially Western governments and to some extent, their publics. There was an urgent demand for expertise to help states and the public comprehend what had happened and what could be done to reduce the threat of it happening again. Very soon, this discourse came to crystallize around what was often termed the Islam problem, 
that Islam contained within it radical tendencies that needed to be denounced, repressed, and even expunged. This became part of a broader discussion about Islam's nature, which is often cast in essentializing terms. You'll be very familiar with phrases such as, Islam is a religion of peace, that Muslims were fundamentally ironic or peaceful, and that radicalism sprang from a misunderstanding or deliberate distortion of Islam's true teachings. And so the policy priorities that followed from this were based on a need to identify who or what represented true Islam, in inverted commas, and how these could be helped, how these forces could be helped, while at the same time identifying the so-called deviant radicals. Such policies were not only seen to be preventing horrific, more horrific terrorism, but also restoring Islam to a benign and pristine form. Counterterrorism and radicalization, anti radicalization programs were rolled out, and projects to foster moderate, tolerant, and indeed pro Western views were initiated within Islamic communities. Very few scholars who were involved in these policy processes and the academic discussion that surrounded them uh, were experts in religion let alone Islam. Instead, it was, as I mentioned before, political scientists, IR exports, experts, uh, security studies specialists who featured prominently, both in shaping public debate on these issues and informing governments of public policy options. Many of the social science scientists brought a very specific set of views and indeed assumptions to their work on religion. They saw it that is religion as distinct, as a distinct generalizable component of social and political analysis. Religion was something that stood apart from other factors, such as history, the economy, and culture. It was possible to understand Islam by itself, shorn of its local particularities and variations. Especially for quantitative scholars, Islam was seen as something objectively measurable through surveys and big data sets. Such approaches and analysis could produce universal theories and broadly applicable templates for action. They could measure, supposedly, the presence of radical and moderate attitudes within a community and pinpoint opportunities for programmatic intervention. Perhaps predictably, instant experts, think tanks and university centres quickly emerged, um, ready to join in these efforts to fix Islam. The American scholar Elizabeth Shuckman Hurd, in her excellent book, Beyond Religious Freedom, calls this phenomenon the religious reform project. This referred to the efforts of Western governments to intervene in Islamic communities in at-risk nations in order to rectify Islam's problems. In actual fact, what was being proposed and indeed undertaken was extensive state engineering of religious attitudes. Islam became the object of government intervention. Not just Western governments, but very often local governments in Muslim majority nations, many of which brought their own political and social agendas to the combating of radicalism and promoting of moderation. Few institutions better epitomize this thinking than the Tony Blair Foundation in Britain. Blair held forth often about the supposed two faces of Islam, the bad and the good. And let me quote him. There are two faces of faith in our world today. One is seen not just in acts of religious extremism, but also in the desire of religious people to wear their faith as a badge of identity in opposition to those who are different. The other face is defined by extraordinary acts of sacrifice and compassion. For example, in caring for the sick, disabled or destitute, all over the world, this battle between the two faces of faith are being played out. Thus, all good, all good appears to reside on one side and all bad on the other. 
And his foundation, the Blair Foundation, committed itself to repressing the bad and encouraging the good. Some Muslims might think this is a little similar to Amar Ma'ruf Nahi Munkar, but anyhow, Tony Blair perhaps was thinking of it in those terms. It was very generously funded and provided post-prime ministerial platform for Blair's international activism. The Blair Foundation was one of dozens of institutions that seeks nothing less than to transform religion. And Heard notes this religious agenda has almost replaced the sort of secularist project. Islam is no longer seen as something that is private, internal to communities, irrelevant to public life, but that religion and politics are now in the public domain, domain and they need to be, and indeed can be, reformed. Religion is now an element or an agent of public belief. So what's the problem with this model of uh, religious reform? Could one not argue that it is commendable to assist Muslims in combating militancy within their faith and promoting tolerance and peace? Would this not bring security and harmony not only to the world, but also to Muslim communities? Well, the answer is that these religious reform agendas are far less successful than they claim, and indeed are very often counterproductive. The problem with this approach is often the sheer shallowness of the analysis and the failure to explore the assumptions that lie within. And I'll give some examples shortly. But to begin with, this, there is a social science assumption that religion is distinct. And many scholars believe this to be deeply flawed. Religion is not easily made a separate variable of analysis because it is inextricably linked to a range of other factors. It can't easily be disaggregated and nor should it be seen as autonomous. There's a kind of secularist assumption that lays behind that perception of uh, Islam as something separate. Aset Bayat, the influential Iranian-American sociologist, dismissed these attempts to isolate Islam from other domains. And he wrote, Muslim societies are never monolithic as such, are never religious by definition, nor are their cultures confined to mere religion. National cultures, horror, historical experiences, political trajectories, as well as class affiliation, have all produced different cultures and subcultures of Islam, religious perceptions and practices across and within Muslim nations. Another man scholar who writes extensively on this, William T. Cavanaugh, um, uh, much of his work is in rebutting the notion that religion is a cause of war or can be an instrument for the bringing of peace. And he, one of the things that he argues very articulately and controversially is that religion in actual fact is a social construct. And it is again, inextricably tied to other factors. So it's a fundamentally flawed approach to imagine that this thing called religion can be studied separately. The second problem with the approach is the reductive binary categories. These are inimical to any nuanced understanding of what is actually going on in Muslim communities. To classify Muslims as good or bad makes no allowance to the range of views and actions of views that Muslims might hold or actions they may partake in. A Muslim might favour democracy and the rule of law, but might, might also be opposed to gender equality, LGBT rights, and interfaith dialogue. Does such a person fit into the good or the bad box? Governments like binaries because they provide clear options, but in reality, they are procrustean. They either ignore or just chop off the bits that don't fit and they failed to do justice to the subtle elements of political and religious life that people have. Let me give you another example of something that emerged from within this religious reform project. And that is Sufism, a topic very close to Islamic mysticism, very close to Tony's heart. And in the mid 2000s, there was a push within the US and particularly from a number of think tanks, notably the Hudson Institute, um, 
that Sufism could be the antidote to radicalism. And so conferences and workshops were held, papers and articles were published to this end. I myself attended a very nice conference at the Sentosa Island Resort in Singapore about 15 years ago that had the theme, Sufism, the answer to radicalism. Um, needless to say, the initiative achieved little apart from directing funding to an array of Sufi leaders and sects. There were hardly any experts in Sufism who attended the conference. And when I told Tony about this, having returned home, he burst out laughing and wondered how anyone could be so prejudiced as to think that this might work. There were lots of ill-fated projects like that over the last 20 years. The third problem with this approach is that the religious reform process produced harmful results within Muslim communities. The first element of this is something that's been written about by many scholars. It's the securitization of state relations with Muslim communities. Muslims were seen first and foremost in terms of supposed threat that they posed to broader society. This in itself produced mistrust of government and resentment in Muslim communities because the faithful were only being viewed through this narrow lens, narrow and indeed distorting lens. So this kind of securitization can distort relations within the community. It also has this distorting effect because it tends to play favorites and to punish groups that are seen as threats on the basis of some externally imposed criteria. Certain groups are privileged, others are treated with prejudice. Very often on the basis of this simple Manichaean good or bad um, uh, toggling perception that I referred to before. Um, this process of only favouring parts of the Muslim community can often worsen relations within, within that community. And we can see this currently in Indonesia, where Nadata Ulama is the darling of the promoting moderate Muslim movement across the world. It is a recipient of re, uh, religious reform, largesse, and other organisations in Indonesia that are also substantially moderate, like Muhammadiyah, Persis, and many others, have largely missed out. There is a hubris here, a conceit that deeply embedded religious norms can be altered with a few years of aid programs or international initiatives. States can repress certain kinds of Islam or foster others, but that is unlikely to change what happens deep within society, deep within the minds of um, its citizens. And particularly when the programs are top down, which most of these international endeavours are, there's no guarantee that what's being said by the national level religious leaders will actually be followed or adhered to by people in the grassroots. Um, the expectation that Muslims will follow preordained sets of behaviours bequeathed to them from uh, most senior leaders uh, is a very dangerous assumption indeed. Now, my central argument here is that it is the absence of religious studies scholars from these global and domestic religious reform projects and discourses that undermines their effectiveness. Lived religion, as any scholar of religion can tell you, is extraordinarily varied and mutable. Great care is needed when generalizing and seeking to formulate topologies, particularly as a predictor to behavior. The religion as set out by state religious authorities or by mainstream Islamic organizations is not necessarily religious adhered, uh, rigidly adhered to by grassroots communities within these organizations. Prescriptions of orthopraxy might be followed only partially. Religious life, real religious life, is often messy and contradictory. There are competing traditions and interests at play. Muslims may aspire to a particular version of piety, but may rarely fulfill it. So many on the ground studies have found enormous variety and behave, of behavior that often confound conventional uh, categorizations about religious type. 
One example I can point to, the recent book by Chris Chaplin on Salafis in Indonesia. This is a community that's often portrayed as highly Arabized, as a Middle Eastern focused community, not an Indonesian focused community, as ultra puritanical and indeed a threat to Indonesia's pluralistic traditions. But what Chaplin shows after very deep research in these communities is that there is a process of significant indigenization of their practices underway, and also a considerable desire to compromise with mainstream groups and with the state in order to expand mainstream support and protect the, um, the burgeoning educational and preaching activities of these Salafi groups. We will often see the label Salafi and assume it denotes a single undifferentiated entity. But what researchers such as Chris Chaplin show is that that is fallacious. It's a much more complicated picture than that. So what is required is a close study of people and communities and what they say, write and write and the texts that influence them and how they communicate. This needs language skills, patience and erudition. These are skills relatively rarely found among quantitative social scientists or security studies experts. This is not to disparage big data approaches or quantitative approaches. They have the ability to tell us many things that qualitative research can't. But to devise policies or to promote discourse without scholarship on religious studies, without its care for detail and the eye for nuance and variegation is to risk miscomprehension and indeed failure. Religious studies scholars don't see religion as clear cut. And that is a great starting point for policy formulation and for scholarly discussion. This brings me back to the work of Tony. He's concerned to probe the layers of meaning in a text or a statement, his priority in reading what shapes the thinking of Indonesian Muslims. This is critical. It means coming to Muslim communities, not with a set of preconceived ideas or theories in mind into which people can be sorted, but rather listening with an open mind, being alive to the interpretive possibilities that are presented. Literature, social media, discourses, preachers, sermons, answers to questions, these are the sorts of things it needs studying. So let me close on a personal note. I must confess to having considerable apprehension in accepting this invitation to talk about Tony's scholarship and contribution, because I felt that I lacked the scholarly skills to do justice to what he has achieved. I don't speak Arabic, I'm not a scholar of the Quran and Islamic sciences. I study the politics of Islam, its doctrines and behavior. I'm not a scholar of Islam as such. But I accepted the invitation with gratitude because I am so deeply thankful to Tony for what he's provided me and to many other researchers on Southeast Asia and Islam through his writings and his personal mentorship. In my case, for 30 years, Tony has encouraged me and with great patience, perhaps forbearance, answered my endless stream of questions. Tony never gave or gives simple or obvious answers. He would ponder a question for a moment before responding, often plucking an apposite quote from a bewildering array of resources that seemed to be circulating in his mind for years, just waiting to be presented to a questioner. These quotes could be from the Bible or from the Quran, from Shakespeare, or he's one of his favorites, yes, minister, <laughs> has its extraordinary ability to retain this information and to find an appropriate place to use it. In fact, his answers often led to more questions, which would require more research and reflection on my part. The thing about these answers was they always gave you a glimpse of a much broader field of study that one could undertake. And I have this continuing sense of marvel at how Tony has done this for so many years and continues to do it till this day. So let me return to where I started by acknowledging the combined achievements of Johanny and Tony and thanking them for all the care and encouragement that they have provided for students like me over so many years, even though I'm now retired, 
and for the wonderful example that they have provided uh, for us in their dedication and love for each other and to the fostering of Indonesian studies. It is most fitting that so many people have gathered here this afternoon to celebrate both of their careers. I thank you very much. What a brilliant and beautiful presentation, uh, Father Greg, on uh, religious and cultural complexity to the study of Southeast Asian Islam and on the two giants of the fields of humanities, Islamic studies and Southeast Asian studies. Um, I just had a bit of chat before uh, uh, this began with uh, Pak Tony outside, and his Arabic is beautiful, beautiful. <laughs> right. Um, it is my great pleasure now to welcome Emeritus Professor Anthony Reed for closing remarks. Please join me in welcoming Emeritus Professor Anthony Reed. Uh, thank you, Greg, for, for a great start to the series. That was fantastic. I have only four sentences. This is going to be short. Uh, we're really good. Uh, as the, the other Tony, the senior Tony, the distinguished Tony has remarked, most of us can only aspire to being honoured a little uh, after we've departed the scene. And it's wonderful that Tony and Yohani have defied the odds to be here to hear their praises rightly sung. But there is another purpose for this lecture series, that will demand the attention of the younger among you after we lucky pioneer generation have passed on. And that is to honor the contribution of ANU to working out how the extraordinary culture and history of Nusantara, particularly Indonesia, could be made accessible as academic subjects. To honor this by keeping the study alive. I hope that this annual lecture will endure and that the endowment may grow enough with your generosity to enable appointments or other steps to be taken to remind Campbell that Indonesia is much more than a security partner or a threat, but an important slice of global culture. Thank you. Thank you so much, Patoli. That now brings the inaugural Tony and Johanny Jones lecture to a close. Thank you all for attending. But before that one, I encourage you to view the brochure provided. So this one. Um, and consider donating to the Tony and Johanny Jones Fund to help this important discussion and work continue. Thank you all and have a great evening. Thank you.